Okay, council members and participants for committee on how we are now live. Public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Sydney Sherlds, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Vice Chair Jones. Present Madam Chair and colleagues. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and colleagues. I am present. Good afternoon. Council Member Bass. Good afternoon. I am present. Thank you. Good afternoon. Council Member Squilla. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on mute. Good afternoon, there, co Good afternoon. colleagues present. <laughs> Council Member Brooks. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm present. Good afternoon. Council Member Driscoll. Good afternoon, all. I'm present. Good afternoon. Thank you. A quorum of the committee has been established and this hearing is now called to order. This is a public hearing of the Committee on Housing, Neighborhood Development and the Homeless regarding resolution number 221031. Ms. Sherlds, will you please read the title of the bill? Resolution number 221031, authorizing the City Council Committee on Housing, Neighborhood Development and the Homeless to conduct hearings regarding discrimination against households holding tenant-based vouchers, putting thousands of vulnerable Philadelphians at risk of homelessness, and the effect of this discrimination on Philadelphia's affordable housing crisis. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By uh, continuing in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few remarks about the legislation uh, before this committee today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank those offering testimony for being here today, as well as my fellow Housing Committee members and everyone listening in. We're here today to discuss discrimination against families and individuals using housing vouchers and how that discrimination has largely kept our most vulnerable residents from being able to find places to live in a housing market that is already hostile toward low income people. About 50 years ago, the federal government began implementing a new type of housing assistance to low income families that was designed to offer more choice in the private rental market. By awarding vouchers that households could use in exchange for rent, renters would no longer be forced to accept whatever apartment the local housing authority had available at that moment, but could instead work with a private landlord in a neighborhood of their choice, and that landlord would get paid the voucher amount from the government every month. Or that was the belief, at least. Fast forward to today. 
voucher holding households have very little choice in a rental market designed to keep low income families of color from high quality homes. I want to shine a light on how dire a situation this is for our lower income rental households and vulnerable populations who rely on vouchers for a safe, healthy and affordable home. Direct rental assistance provided by tenant vouchers is the quickest and most effective way to get low income families into homes, given the severe lack of affordable housing. This is because vouchers serve families earning a much lower income than most new apartment buildings constructed with government subsidy, as well as new rent restricted units created through the zoning codes, various mixed income housing and mixed income neighborhood uh, provisions. In 2022, 75% of PHA's almost 19,000 voucher households were classified as extremely low income, earning 30% of the region's area median income or below, well below in most circumstances. There's no way that government can build that many deeply affordable housing units. And so we need direct rental assistance vouchers uh, to fill the gap. But vouchers only work if landlords accept them. That's why Philadelphia created the Local Fair Practices Ordinance, which protects tenants from unfair rental practices by landlords and prohibits landlords from refusing to rent based on a tenant's source of income, including tenant-based vouchers. I am grateful that this ordinance exists. Studies show that voucher utilization rates are higher and racial segregation is lower in jurisdictions that have these source of income anti-discrimination laws in place. And so I shudder to think about where we'd be without them. However, we know in practice that most landlords still see accepting tenant vouchers as a choice and not the legal requirement that it is. Local studies show that more than 65% of Philadelphia landlords are still not accepting tenant-based vouchers citywide, and that figure goes up to 83% in low-poverty neighborhoods. This widespread uh, discrimination dis disproportionately affects Black households, who comprise over 80% of PHA's voucher population. Tenant vouchers are a proxy for other types of discrimination we're all too familiar with and are federally protected against, such as race, gender, national origin, family status, and disability. My office gets calls weekly from constituents who cannot find a place to use their vouchers, and it really came to a head last year in my district when almost 400 government-subsidized housing units in University City were cleared at the same time. Many of these families were provided vouchers to help them relocate, but none of them were able to find commensurate relocation housing in University City, most having to move multiple miles away unless they were able to find a unit within a PHA complex. And considering the development boom that the city is experiencing, this problem is only going to get worse if we don't intervene. Let's think about what it means to be forced to give up your voucher, something that many voucher holders have had no choice but to do if they wanted to actually find a place to live. Giving up a voucher means giving up hundreds of dollars in rental assistance each month that you're entitled to by law, which is oftentimes up to half of your effective income. That is absolutely life shattering. This heartbreaking but increasingly common scenario really crystallized for me the severity of this issue. Not only does it make you feel like an other or lesser than, but it strips you and your family of the many opportunities that living in amenity rich neighborhoods provide, such as walkable access to schools, healthcare, basic goods and services, and family sustaining jobs. Everyone deserves a high quality, stable home in whatever neighborhood they please. And residents using housing vouchers deserve the freedom to look across Philadelphia and use their voucher wherever there is a vacancy. Because for many of our neighbors, their housing voucher is nothing more than a false promise of hope and housing security. I fully understand that changes might need to be made to this program to ensure that it works better for property owners. But let me be clear. Philadelphia will no longer stand for the rampant illegal discrimination against working class black and brown families using housing vouchers. To discriminatory landlords, your time is up. We are cracking down on this injustice today.
Thank you so much. And I'd like to offer um, an opportunity for other members of the, com the committee to make opening remarks. Uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by thank you, you Chair Gautier, for spearheading, spearheading this hearing and bringing much needed attention to this issue. Um, because we're in the midst of a housing crisis in Philadelphia and discrimination against those who have vouchers is such a major part of this problem, as you spoke earlier. Um, with skyrocketing rents and housing pri prices, vouchers are one of the few tools we currently have to keep families off the streets um, and keep Philadelphians in their homes and in their communities and also give children safe, stable and healthy homes um, from which to go to school and grow up. The discrimination that those uh, voucher holders face undermines the life-saving benefits that housing vouchers provide. And uh, we've heard counsel countless stories in our office from folks being denied an apartment because they haven't a voucher or um, even though their rent will be fully paid. While this discrimination discrimination is clearly illegal, enforcement of these policies is, is so weak that landlords feel comfortable to even blatantly list um, on their advertisement that vouchers are not accepted. Um, and this type of discrimination takes a toll on Philadelphians and our city. Those with vouchers must spend huge amount of time and energy trying to find a landlord who is willing to comply with the law um, and accept their vouchers. And voucher holders also must spend hours waiting through complicated, slow, and dehumanizing process um, of using that voucher or extension the voucher timeline, which is something we hear that happens quite often. Um, and this time of energy could be spent with, folk, you know, by folks spending time with their families and their communities and even working, right? So voucher discrimination we know is rooted in racism and classism and also um, is a result of government failure. Um, so when the federal government stopped building public housing vouchers were sold as a free mar a better for the free market, and our alternative to providing housing. However, the vouching program has served in large part as a subsidy for big landlords who make large profits while tenants are forced into undesirable buildings and neighborhoods and compelled to spend under uh, compelled to spend months and months um, looking for a landlord that's willing to accept it. Um, and also while navigating um, the bureaucracy, um, and sometimes it requires a lawyer. Our voucher system simply does not work, and at least currently in its present form. Four in 10 tenants with emergency housing vouchers are unable to use it. For example, in November 22, there were nearly 800 Philadelphian families unable to find a home, even though they had the vouchers. And there are thousands of Philadelphians who desperately need a stable home, even um, if they have money to pay their rent, but unable to because the voucher discrimination in our broken system. So we need to imagine new tools to address the housing crisis in Philadelphia when it works for tenants. But in the meantime, we need to make sure vouchers work for Philadelphians. Um, and this means um, str stronger or more stringent and effective enforcement of the um, the prohibition of voucher discrimination, it means more accessible and simple PHA process that does not require a lawyer and does not leave tenants feeling dehumanized. Um, it means higher voucher limits from the federal government so that renters can live in neighborhoods that they want to. And um, a strong voucher system means that families can stay in their communities, children can stay in their schools, and all Philadelphians have a right um, to a stable and healthy home because that's a basic right. So thank you so much, Council Member uh, Gautier, for organizing this hearing, and I look forward um, to learning more about this and joining you in this work towards solutions moving forward. Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, are there any other members of the committee that would like to make opening comments? Okay. Great. Um, Ms. Charles, will you please call the first panel or witness we have to testify today? Sari Bernstein and Dominique Wiggins. Wonderful. Um, Sari Bernstein, are you there and connected?
I'm here. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? I can. Can you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes. My name is Sari Bernstein and I am a staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center. Thank you for allowing me to testify today about voucher discrimination, a pervasive issue in Philadelphia that prevents low-income renters of color from obtaining safe, quality, and affordable housing in neighborhoods of their choice. As you know, Philadelphia has an affordable housing crisis. I will not repeat all the statistics um, that uh, Council Members Gautier and Brooks just mentioned, but would refer the committee to our written testimony that's in the record. In practice, as you know, the largest rental assistance program in Philadelphia is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, commonly referred to as Section 8, which is funded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development and administered locally by the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Philadelphia's local Fair Practices Ordinance prohibits discrimination on the basis of source of income, which is defined broadly. It includes any lawful source of income, including but not limited to housing assistance programs. And consistent with the language of the ordinance, the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, which I'll refer to as the commission, the city agency charged with enforcing the Fair Practices Ordinance, interprets this protection to include any lawful income, subsidy, or benefit with which an individual supports themselves and their dependents, including but not limited to federal, state, or local public assistance, medical assistance, or rental assistance programs. Although the law has been on the books for over 40 years, we know that it is flagrantly violated. In addition to some of the statistics you've already heard today, more recently, in 2022, the city's draft assessment of fair housing cited that nearly 50% of respondents said that source of income is the reason they were treated differently when looking for housing. This is the second highest response after race. And not only did surveyed individuals routinely raise source of income discrimination, but representatives from both fair housing organizations cited increased reports of source of income discrimination. Housing choice voucher holders in Philadelphia are largely located in low income, racially concentrated neighborhoods and not in integrated opportunity rich neighborhoods as envisioned by the HCV program. I was really disappointed to see that 43% of housing choice voucher households live in neighborhoods that are over 80% black, whereas only 1% of housing choice voucher households live in neighborhoods that are over 80% white. In other words, despite their subsidy, these Philadelphians are actually locked out of the rental housing market and large swaths of the city. And statistics bear this out. We know that of the 863 emergency housing choice vouchers administered to Philadelphia in 2021, 322 or nearly 4%, 40%, excuse me, of the vouchers issued under the program are unused today. So the city must take urgent steps to ensure that Philadelphia landlords follow this vital tenant protection because fair housing laws are only realized their objectives with a parallel commitment to enforcement. Studies show this as well. Jurisdictions with strong source of income discrimination protections, including enforcement, show that voucher utilization goes up. Because in Philadelphia, source of income discrimination complaints require administrative exhaustion at the commission, meaning complainants must first file their allegations of discrimination with the commission before proceeding to court, the commission plays a really key role in efforts to enforce the law and reduce source of income discrimination. The Law Center's recent experience representing both individuals and the Housing Equality Center of Pennsylvania, a fair housing organization, and source of income discrimination complaints at the commission provides insight into targeted steps the city and in particular the commission can take to counteract this form of discrimination. Our experience also shows that enforcement really works. A recent settlement with a large Philadelphia landlord resulted in the landlord agreeing to encourage and accept voucher applications in all 77 of their properties. This is significant. So the following recommendations come with an appreciation that the commission's resources and budget are currently too limited to accomplish its laudable goals. We therefore call on the city council to increase funding and other resources to the commission so that it may realize its charter mandated duties. These recommendations reflect that primary mandate of the commissions to educate, 
to investigate and to enforce. First, the commission must educate the public, housing providers and tenants alike, through advertisements, targeted social media, print, and other means that source of income is a protected class under the ordinance. Voucher holders are turned away from rental opportunities solely because of their voucher status so often and so flagrantly that they're reasonably shocked to learn that this behavior is a violation of the law. The education should be broad, visible, and undertaken in conjunction with fair housing organizations, community-based organizations, and Office of Homeless Services contract providers to reach the most impacted communities. Second, the commission must be both proactive and responsive in its duties to investigate violations of the ordinance. Voucher holders experiencing housing instability cannot be solely responsible for ferreting out reporting and confronting discriminatory behavior. The commission should also proactively engage with fair housing organizations and other local agencies to root out the discriminatory conduct. But when voucher holders do come forward with allegations of discrimination, the commission must timely respond to and investigate those complaints in a matter accessible to unrepresented individuals. By way of example, for three complaints our office filed in August of 2019, the commission took between 11 months and two years to complete its investigations. This is too long. The ordinance calls for an investigation period of 100 days and less impracticable, and to provide notice when the investigation period does exceed 100 days. Then, once the investigation concludes, the commission cannot shy away from issues of fact. For example, on one occasion, despite written proof that discrimination occurred, the commission apparently dismissed the claim simply because the landlord denied it. And on another occasion, despite collaborating proof that discrimination occurred, the, dismiss the commission dismissed that claim too. And third, the commission's obligation to enforce the source of income protection is tied to the administrative exhaustion requirement in the ordinance. The commission has one full year of exclusive jurisdiction while it investigates or otherwise contemplates the complaint. City Council should consider amending the Fair Practices Ordinance to bring this requirement in line with other jurisdictions and areas of the law. For example, City Council could provide that a person may file a complaint with the commission or has a private right of action in the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. Or City Council could follow, follow a model that's akin to the EEOC. That is, a person must first file a complaint with the commission, after which the commission has 100 days to investigate. Before this 100 days expires, a person may request and receive what's called a notice of right to sue if the commission will be unable to complete the investigation within 100 days. After 100 days, a person may request and must receive a notice of right to sue if the investigation is not complete. And finally, transparency is paramount to fair housing enforcement. The commission must publicize settlement, settlement agreements and public hearing decisions that further the purpose of the Fair Practices Ordinance and the Fair Housing Law. The commission's commitment to achieving fair housing in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia is commendable and it's in a really unique position to put teeth into this often ignored provision of the ordinance. The scope of the problem is simply too large to go unattended. Philadelphia must ensure that housing providers abide by its source of income discrimination protection. We are glad to engage and work, with, and work through solutions with the commission and with all relevant partners. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Thank you so much for being here today, for your work and for that um, really illuminating testimony. Um, Dominique Wiggins, are you there and connected? Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Or, hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, can you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes, uh, hi, my name is Dominique Wiggins. Um, I'm an attorney at Community Legal Services in the housing unit. Thank you and good afternoon to the commission and the committee um, for allowing us the opportunity to address the issues that we find um, as it relates to resolution 221031. Um, Community Legal Services is a nonprofit organization providing free civil legal representation to low income Philadelphians as well as systematic advocacy and support of our clients. The housing unit represents over 3,000 uh, tenant households um, annually, many of whom are Section 8, housing, Section 8 housing choice voucher holders. 
Um, there are many barriers facing our clients. My colleagues and I have witnessed how many low-income tenants face meta metaphorical brick walls and slamming doors when searching for housing, um, high application fees, minimum income requirements, stringent credit checks, blanket bans on tenants with eviction records, high security deposits due immediately, landlord reference bias, and burdensome insurance requirements, to name a few, are some of the issues that we frequently see our tenants facing on a daily basis. Even more challenging is finding accessible housing for people with disabilities because of so many um, Philadelphia row homes and apartment buildings having staircases cases and not having accessibility for those who have mobility issues. The City Council was instrumental in passing the Renters Access Act in 2021, which prohibits Philadelphia landlords from blanket bans based on credit scores or eviction history by requiring an individualized assessment of a tenant's credit and prohibiting the use of certain eviction records, and we continue to work towards implementing those changes on the ground. Um, along with the challenges facing all, all tenants, tenants with vouchers face the additional barrier of discrimination simply because they are a participant in a subsidized housing program. Being able to provide proof of income that meet these requirements or have a lengthy um, credit checks um, or job history requirements are really difficult for these tenants as they are on subsidized income. Um, while there are many reasons a landlord may refuse to rent to people with vouchers, including race and class-based prejudices, many landlords voice frustration, confusion, or misconceptions about the Philadelphia Housing Authority and its administration of the program. Um, we can look at voucher success rates, the measure of how many vouchers is issued by housing authority that result in a lease signing to know that vouchers are not easy to use in Philadelphia. In the 90s, a study found that voucher success rates nationwide was about 81%. In 2001, it was measured at 69%. And in a recent HUD study of 2019 data puts the rate at about 61% nationally. And while this study doesn't include PHA, HUD data on PHA's emergency housing voucher utilization indicates that 59% of emerging ho emergency housing vouchers in Philadelphia have been utilized, 863 awarded by HUD and only 512 leased. That means four out of every 10 tenants given an emergency housing voucher cannot use it and are at risk of losing it. And as of November of 2022, there were 738 households with vouchers who were looking for a place to rent, and most of those households are still looking for places to rent, despite being almost six months past that point. PHA subsidized over 20,000 tenant families through their voucher program. As such, PHA is an important partner in the city of Philadelphia, and we propose the following ways in which we as tenant advocates, the city of Philadelphia, landlord associations, and PHA can partner to find solutions to the following issues facing tenants with vouchers. The first of which is education for tenants and all landlords that refusing to rent to a tenant with a voucher is discrimination under the Philadelphia Unfair Practice Ordinance. PHA as a public agency can have an important role in this education through its communication with tenants and landlords and its public facing documents and information. And, but essentially just educating tenants and landlords across the city of Philadelphia will increase the number of tenants who are able to successfully use their vouchers when starting the renting process. Uh, secondly, um, flexibility in the voucher issuance and timeliness so that tenants have the paperwork and the time that they need to find housing. Um, in light of the many barriers that tenants face moving with vouchers, it is important that tenants are able to timely obtain a voucher when they find a place to rent so they don't lose that opportunity. Tenants also often need extensions on their voucher when they can't find a place to rent right away and need to be allowed those extensions. Both of these issues presents tenants presents challenges to tenants currently. Um, Additionally, the ease of access for both tenants and landlords, the voucher leasing process is often challenging and confusing for both tenants and landlords, and it can take a long time to finalize. Uh, PHA has already been taking steps to improve the leasing process, and we want to work with PHA, landlords, and the city to continue to identify ways to make the process more accessible for everyone. The solutions would address speedy inspections and reinspections, um, clear communication about the next steps and timeliness, a leasing process that matches the timeline in the private market, market so that voucher tenants have an equal opportunity and footing um, when it comes to renting. Lastly, uh, we're asking that to ensure that the PHA's PA payment standards are in line with the landlords, with what landlords are able to charge on the private market, so that tenants can meaningfully lease up with their vouchers throughout the city. 
as everyone, as has already been stated um, by council members and by um, Sari, housing has increased significantly. And with that, we are, we are hoping that PHA would be updating their their payment information and their standards on an annual basis and continue to ask HUD for permission when necessary for increases so that tenants who do have these vouchers um, can afford housing in um, safe um, neighborhoods that they so choose. Um, in addition to these proposals, we look forward to partnering with the city and landlords to identify solutions to other barriers faced by tenants renting with vouchers, including housing counseling to assist tenants looking for housing and rental assistance to help cover emergencies um, and for security deposits. Um, we appreciate Council Member Gautier for hosting this hearing and City Council for your investigation of these issues and possible solutions. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon, everyone. The chair is experiencing some technical difficulties, so we're waiting for her to log back on. I can hear you, Council Member. Um, But Cheryl, is it we fit up for with the last um somewhere? I'm sorry, Chair Gaudier, I couldn't quite make out what you were saying. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Did we finish up fully with the last um, set of testimony? Yes, Dominique just finished her testimony. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a few questions. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, for the testimony um, from the Public Interest Law Center. Um, are you able to tell us, you know, I appreciated how you gave us very detailed um, thoughts on how um, you know, the FAIR, uh, the Human Relations Commission can um, have added capacity to do this work um, in, a, in a better way that will help more tenants and on how we can amend the FAIR practices ordinance. Um, I was wondering if you could share more just as you're thinking about that uh, capacity at the commission, what does that look like in terms of an expansion from where we are to re where we really need to be um, to enforce the negative work? And are there um, places and localities that are doing this work really well um, and have what they what is needed both at the local enforcement um, uh, place, but also in terms of how the ordinance is actually written. Um, are there localities that we can look at? So I, I apologize, Council Member. I'm, I, the end of your questions got cut off a bit, but I'm going to do my best to try to answer them. And if I miss something, you know, please, um, please ask again. Um, you know, in in terms of uh, what I heard from your your last question about other jurisdictions, I mean, our experience at the law center is, of course, um, limited to um, Philadelphia, uh, but the um, some of these ideas do come from you know some some things that other jurisdictions are doing. So, 
Um, for example, uh, that's where the idea about um, city council considering whether um, to require administrative exhaustion at, at the commission um, is something that they want to take a look at again. Um, for example, in New York City and in DC, there is not administrative um, exhaustion requirement, which, which means that the private right of action can um, go straight into court. And so um, that can potentially have uh, different consequences. Um, as to you know, your first question, I certainly don't want to speak for the commission, and I don't know that I have the insight to say exactly what their resources are um, and what they could be. But just speaking from from our experience, it's it's um, simply that the the investigations do take quite a bit of time, and so you know, as we're thinking through, as we hear from from tenants um, about about what what they are going through. Um, usually the discrimination is occurring right at a moment of severe crisis um, for these tenants and for the family. The number one priority, as it um, should be, is on finding a place to live. And that's where the statute of limitations comes in and is so important that tenants do have 300 days to file a complaint. Um, however, you know, tenants also reasonably, when they do find a place to live, um, are then need to live their busy lives, um, whatever that that may be. And so we're trying to think through, you know, um, what what resources might the commission um, need to be able to to focus on the three things that that I spoke about, which is um, number one, the enforcement piece. And so what resources are needed to try to move that enforcement piece along as quickly um, as possible for all of the parties um, to the investigation. Uh, piece which can be both in response to tenant complaints or might be proactive um, and based on either you know uh, uh, listings, postings that might say that they you know landlords will not take section eight vouchers or housing choice vouchers or other comments that are heard um, from folks within the the community. Um, and uh, and then the final piece of that, which is the education piece, you know, I think we we picture and we know this from um, other jurisdictions as well, where there's a really strong, um, very broad education campaign, which does require resources that that works um, very well to have to um, uh, have tenants understand what um, what they are supposed to be experiencing when they are looking for an apartment and then also um, what landlords are you know, required to do under the law. Um, you know, I guess I, what I want to just sort of say is that the, the issues that the commission um, are dealing with with source of income discrimination in particular, because it's so blatant, um, they're, they're sometimes straightforward. And a lot of times, at least the folks who we talk to, they have written proof of the discrimination. Um, they get it in a text message or they get it in an email. So, you know, our hope is that um, when the commission is investigating those complaints, that they should move along um, they should move along quicker so that the tenant can see resolution of of those complaints. Did I, I hope that answers um, your questions? So please tell me if not. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and I also um, heard you say that you thought uh, the commission should provide more educational opportunities for landlords and property owners. Um, can you talk more about what that might look like in practice? Sure. So, and I think this is, you know, something that the fair housing organizations will also have a lot to say um, about because this is really sort of their their bread and butter, but. Um, landlords need to understand what the law requires so that they can follow the law. Um, and I think there's different ways, you know, one can think about going about that. Um, working with community-based organizations, working with the Office of Homeless Services, I'm sure that the commission would be able to understand where are the target communities, um, the landlords, the property management companies, you know, the housing providers um, that need this kind of um, education and try to target the education to those communities. Um, education can take a lot of different forms. You know, I think there can be meetings. Um, there can be really easily accessible information on websites, um, particularly on the commission's website. 
um, you know, which I which can include information about about the law, um, what it looks like to follow the law, what are the consequences for not following the law. Um, and then there are other, you know, more creative ways, I think, to think about an education campaign that's just simply public, you know, on buses, in the subway, um, places where folks are every single day so that they can understand that this is something that um, is required under the law and really matters. And so that if they have questions, they know who to go to um, to talk about, uh, you know, what the law requires. Thank you for that. And Ms. Wiggins, do you want to um, add anything, you know, from your experience working with your clients at um, CLS? Um, are there things that you think the city can do to make this work better? And are there places where um, that are really cracking down on this sort of discrimination? Oh, thank you so much for the question, Councilwoman. Um, Specifically, are there any specific agencies that I know of directly that are cracking down on this issue um, other than PILK? Not necessarily to my personal knowledge, but that doesn't mean that the work is not being done. Um, and one of the major issues that we see is just the timeline, the, the quick turnaround time. Um, just like sorry, I mentioned when it comes to the PCHR complaints, Tenants who I see are most likely tenants who are already in landlord tenant court for one reason or another, and whether the landlord is seeking to just get possession of the property so that they can sell it or, you know, the market value is increased so it's no longer profitable for them to have a, a, a Section 8 housing choice voucher tenant there. The time period in which these tenants are forced to relocate, pack up and move is very short, and there's not much time that we can always buy them. Um, but we do know that the process is that there is support that is needed um, directly what that support is. I'm not sure of at this current time, but there is the biggest issue with the time in which these tenants are forced to move. They have the vouchers, the vouchers are set in place, but the voucher process is very timely. Um, it's very arduous. It's a lot of paperwork. It's not super um, detailed and outlined and exactly what steps are next. Um, and tenants find themselves needing a lot of additional support when it comes time for them to vacate and move on to a new location. I um, mean, then once you throw in the fact that landlords are already discriminating against tenants because they have the vouchers, it makes that process for them a lot more difficult, a lot more stressful, a lot um, more, you know, it just makes them have a more difficult time and it gives tenants less hope that they'll find housing that's actually affordable, safe, and accessible for themselves and their families. Um, I know at CLS, it's our biggest desire to make sure that we can help tenants transition more smoothly into their next housing opportunity. Um, and we will work with the city council and PHA and whatever means is necessary to ensure that we can provide that additional support to tenants when they're looking for new housing. Thank you so much. Um, are there any additional questions or comments um, for this panel from members of the committee? Okay, um, Ms. Sherald, can you please call the next panel or witness to testify? Dolores Bell, Tamika Anglin, Deanna Roundtree, Kim Waller, Rachel Wentworth. Um, Dolores Bell, are you there and connected? Yes, ma'am. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes, ma'am. My name is Dolores Bell and I'm a Section 8 tenant currently living in Frankfurt. I'm here today as a member of Runners United Philadelphia and as someone who believes that all tenants deserve to be treated fairly. Thank you for inviting me to share my story about how difficult it is as a voucher holder to find housing in Philadelphia. I have lived in my current apartment for nearly almost four years, but I want to move for two reasons. First, my parents are getting older and they need someone to look after them. They live in Germantown and I would like to move to an apartment closer to them so that I can help them out when they're needed. Second, it's my dream to be a foster parent. I have 10 grandchildren already and two great grands, and I believe that children need guidance and all the love they deserve. I want to provide this guidance and love as a foster parent, but my apartment is cur currently too small to host a foster child long term. I need a two bedroom apartment, but finding an apartment where I can use a voucher is very hard in Philadelphia. 
I've searched online for a two-bedroom apartment in Germantown, and I see there are plenty of options, but many of the apartments are too expensive and won't cover my voucher. I wish the voucher would cover high rents because that would make it easier to find housing. And once you look at the apartments that are in the voucher price range, most of them won't accept vouchers. I've called 10 to 20 places and they've all told me they don't accept the vouchers. I'm a good tenant. I have reference and photos to prove that. It's just that they throw you anywhere they want to throw you. And um, neighborhoods that's like really terrible and you know that's not livable. And the apartment that I live in is not bad, but it's not good at the end of the day. But finding an apartment where a voucher is used is very hard in Philadelphia. Once again, I've searched for an apartment in Germantown and I see that there are plenty, but many of them are not accepting. I've called, I've called and I'm called. I'm a good tenant also, once again. I have reference and photos to prove that. My apartment is in good condition. I've always paid my rent, but I don't even have the chance to prove that I'm a good tenant when landlords flat out refuse to accept voucher holders. I, it's hurtful at times to be stereotyped like this. I, it doesn't have to be this hard. Um, I've lived in North Carolina prior to that. Where I lived before, it was much easier to find a good apartment with a voucher. And the housing authorities there, they assisted voucher holders through the process. They even provided a list of places that accepted Section 8. And the homes available in North Carolina are clean and nice places. If I didn't have to care for my parents, I would I would go back. I would move back to North Carolina. The city needs to really take action and to listen to the tenants who testify here today. We're not being treated fairly by the landlords and refuse to even consider our application just because we have vouchers. I want to find a place where I can care for my parents and a foster child, but I need to find a landlord who will accept my voucher first. It shouldn't be this hard. But I thank you for your time respectfully, Dolores Bell. That's thank all I you have so much. Us. No, thank you so much, Ms. Bell, for being here with us. I'm so sorry to hear um, how hard it has been for you um, to find safe housing um, and a good situation for you and your family. And thank you for also sharing um, how differently this worked in North Carolina. That's something that we should be emulating. So I appreciate you. Yes, um, ma'am. Tamika, um, Tamika Anglin, I see you there. Um, nice to see you. Um, <laughs> can you state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? My name is Tamika Anglin, and I am the mother of three adult children. In 1987, after the birth of my first child, I applied for Section 8, now known as Housing Choice Voucher. I lived at the mercy of others for many years. At one point, I had to send my two-year-old daughter out of state to live with family because it was easier to find housing for one than for two. I was living in transitional housing in 1995 when my number came up. I found a property that will work for my family and a landlord willing to accept the voucher. The benefits of that stability can't be overstated. Whether I had no job, a piece of job, or was fully employed, I was always certain that we had a safe, warm, and affordable place to lay our heads every night. Housing security allowed me to obtain a bachelor's degree and a liv livable income. My children have gone their own ways, but they know where home is. My eligibility for Section 8 ended in 2020, but I have been in the same house since 1995. However, in February of 2019, that stability was threatened because my landlord did not want to renew my lease. I needed to find new housing in 60 days. The search was anxiety producing. I couldn't even find property owners who would respond to my inquiry because of the voucher. In these gentrifying years, being unhoused has become yet another crisis. There are many employed, typically functioning people who are unhoused or living precariously simply because they can't afford rent. I thought me and my teen daughter were going to be homeless. The search for housing is fraught with bias and discrimination. Black, young, number of children, 
unmarried, and then you add a Section 8 voucher, and we all know your perception as a quality tenant drops into the toilet. So much so that we also know you better ask first. So I call, I email, I text. Do you accept Section 8? No, sorry, nope. And these were only the ones who responded. Typically, landlords don't respond. Little did I know, it's illegal to refuse a prospective tenant based on holding a voucher, which is source of income discrimination. Thankfully, at the same time, Charlene Samuels, Constituent Services Director Extraordinaire, worked with PHA to address my landlord's financial needs, which allowed me to stay in my home. Though my own situation had stabilized, I understood that many people struggled to find safe, affordable housing, even with a voucher. I was connected to Public Interest Law Center to file a complaint with the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations because I had written evidence of two refusals based on holding a voucher. Unfortunately, that process was also less than ideal. I filed filed two complaints in August of 2019. The first complaint was dismissed, even though the landlord texted that they didn't accept vouchers. Why wasn't that evidence enough? The second complaint languished until the commission eventually found probable cause to proceed two years after the filing. But then it took another year to go through the conciliation process with the commission. The complaint was finally settled in June of 2022. Three years is too long, especially when the evidence is in writing and the landlord admits to discrimination. My situation was resolved, but what happened to me happens to people every day without much in the way of justice. Most people are living so insecurely that it only takes a momentary glitch in the matrix to end up on the street. The rights of those who need housing assistance should be enforced as vigorously as laws against racial, gender identity, sexual orientation, and religious discrimination. Please put in place policies that support tenants who are trying to enforce their rights before the PCHR. Landlords must comply with Philadelphia's law against source of income discrimination, just like all of the other protected classes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamika. Um, thank you for sharing your experience um, trying to find and secure um, affordable housing and your experience in trying to report, you know, one of these claims and move it forward. And thanks also um, for your critical work. I know you were a part of Councilmember Brooks's office um, when she did, you know, really, really critical work on this, like um, the renter's access bill, and we appreciate you. Thank you. Um, Deanna Roundtree, are you there? I see you. Um, can you state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Deanna? Um, okay, I'll wait to see. If they will come on. Is Kim Waller there and connected? Hello. Hi. Um, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Kimberly Waller. Um, I am a tenant in Barkham Village. Hi, I'm a tenant in Bartram Village, Philadelphia, um, in Philadelphia, in Southwest Philadelphia, and um, I have had a voucher. Um, actually, this is my second voucher. Uh, the first one expired, and I never found a place to live. Um, some of the uh, properties were very in uninhabitable, um, and some of the landlords wouldn't even rent to me because I had a voucher. And they they just refused to give me a call back. And a few that did call back asked um, questions like, well, how much is your voucher worth? And, um, well, you know, well, why do you want to live in this area? And things of that nature. Um, right now, the voucher I have 
some of the landlords haven't even called back. I've had to call the uh, the realtors to get a call back. And even with that, it's like ducking and dodging. Like there's, It's like they don't want to be bothered with us. And um, I've spoken to one gentleman, and he said he doesn't even want to deal with Section 8 anymore because I guess the pandemic really, uh, I guess, just threw them off and just really dissuaded them from wanting to deal with Section 8. And it makes it look bad on people like myself who do get up and go to work every day and who do pay rent and who are upstanding citizens and tenants. And um, when I did have my uh, my voucher, <clears throat> I spoke with people in the called the hot mobility program because I wanted to port out. I was told that I had to reapply to the county, get on the waiting list, and and I found out that was not true. It was all a lie. Um, when I tried to get help, there was really no one to help you. They basically said you're on your own. Those were the exact words. You are on your own. There's not enough uh, property for the amount of voucher holders that are out there. What are we supposed to do? And there has to be something that can be done. You know, everybody deserves a safe, clean place to live. You know, that that everybody, they're talking about low income. Oh, they're making low income housing. They're making, they're bringing low income housing and, you know, um, they're making all these places for people to live in, in, in West and Southwest Philadelphia, but it's not low income for people in my income bracket. Low income for a hundred to a hundred and a hundred thousand plus, that's not helping people like myself. Hello? Yes, I hear you. We hear you, Ms. Oh. Fuller. Um, are you I didn't, I didn't know whether the phone. No, I didn't know know whether the phone had cut off or not. I'm sorry. We hear you um, loudly and just, clearly. Yes, and I just I just wanted to you know be known. We are here. We see you. We hear you, and we know what you're doing. Just know that we know that it's wrong. I know when I'm being lied to, and so do the rest of us tenants. And when people get fed up, we get fed up and we show up in numbers. And there's also a thing called escrow. And when you, we start putting our money away, hey, don't say you didn't know. But you need to treat your tenants right. People in Bartram Village have been waiting for years for help. Like right now, we need help. There have been break-ins. I've been asking for years. I've been volunteering with, with PHA as a PHA ambassador to get help in Bartram Village. Even now, I've been asking. We need cameras, okay? Cameras. There have been break-ins. People have been getting robbed. Simple things that they put up in other communities. Why can't we get them? What's the problem? We're not important enough, to put it in a nutshell. We need to be treated right. I get up and go to work just like many other tenants do. My dollar counts. It matters. I have a voucher. I need a place to live. A two-bedroom apartment, I mean, a two-bedroom voucher. I have a voucher. They didn't even put the amount of the, of the voucher on my, my voucher. Like how much my voucher is supposed to be, it's not on there. It's illegible. The name of the person who signed it, they usually the um the the uh the representative, you can't even tell who the person is. And I know Brett Holden is there. I'm quite sure he can find out who did this. I'm quite sure Mr. Calvin Jeremiah is there. He can find out who did this. I'm quite sure Mr. Kyle Flood, someone is there. They can tell me. Who signed on my voucher and did not put the price um, of the, um, the, the the amount that my voucher should um, 
the amount about the va- the value of my voucher. It should state some va- the amount. It's not on there. It should there should be a name of a representative, a Mister or Mrs. S- it should say if it was Cynthia Brown, just using it as a, an example. It says nothing. It's just a last name written in cursive, and you can't even. It's illegible. Come on. And they make it that I believe they do it that way just to, to leave you running in circles. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Waller. Um, thank you for sharing um, your story and the frustrations with using the voucher, as well as um, some of the things that you're confronting um, at Bartram's Village. Um, we do have um, Brett Holden and Kelvin Jeremiah here, and oh, I know wonderful. that we're willing. Thank you. We're all listening and we will follow up on those specific uh, concerns. And we thank you so much for your testimony today. You are very welcome. Have a great day. You too. Um, Rachel Wentworth, are you there and connected? Yes, I'm here. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Wentworth, and I'm the executive director of the Housing Equality Center. HECP has worked since 1956 to advocate for the rights of individuals and families to have non-discriminatory access to the housing of their choice in the greater Philadelphia region. To this end, one of the main activities conducted by HECP is its Fair Housing Testing Program. Fair housing testing is essentially mystery shopping in order to observe the business practices of a housing provider, such as a landlord or a property manager. Testing is typically conducted to document whether home seekers are being treated equally or whether the housing provider is complying with fair housing laws, as well as providing qualitative data regarding the experiences faced by consumers. Over the past two years, HECP has begun to test for compliance with the source of income protections in rental housing under the Philadelphia Fair Practices Ordinance. During this period, HECP has sent testers to inquire about the willingness of housing providers advertising affordable housing units falling within the fair market rent standard to accept housing choice vouchers as a form of payment. In 62 tester contacts, 42 of those, or 71% of the testers, were told that vouchers were not accepted. Only 10 testers, or 16%, were told that vouchers, voucher holders were permitted to apply. And the remaining tests were inconclusive, with housing providers either declining to provide a definitive answer, telling testers that the unit was already rented or testers being unable to have a conversation in which substantive information was exchanged. And in all of the contexts where testers were told that vouchers were not accepted, the providers were all very straightforward in stating this policy, saying things like, no, we don't participate in the Section 8 program. No, we do not accept housing vouchers. Uh, Some providers stated some variation on no, we're not required to. Um, And in many cases, housing providers volunteered broader policies, such as none of our properties are registered with the Section 8 program, none of our owners accept vouchers, or owners decide individually whether or not they want to participate in the Section 8 program. And then in addition, in a small number of tests, housing providers also indicated additionally that other types of non-employment income, such as child support or SSDI, would not count towards income qualifications. And although this is a preliminary, this preliminary series of tests represents a small and non-representative sample of rental transactions occurring in Philadelphia, they do tell us that source of income protections are routinely and blatantly disregarded by landlords, property managers, and rental agents throughout the city. It's apparent that voucher holders regularly face unlawful discrimination as an additional barrier in their source for a lim- search for a limited supply of affordable rental housing in Philadelphia. 
And additionally, the recurrent and unconcealed denials faced by our testers leads us to presume that there's also a widespread perpetuation of the erroneous belief that engaging in discrimination based on source of income is a lawful practice. So both effective enforcement and substantial consumer and provider education regarding the current existing protections are truly vital to ensuring the rights of uh, the rights of voucher holders and holding rental housing providers accountable to their fair housing obligations. Thank you for your attention to this important issue and for the opportunity to comment. Thank you so much for being here today and thank you for your really important work. Um, David Smith, are you there and connected? I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be short and sweet, but it is going to be a lot of detail. So if it goes a little over, it goes a little over because I got to get it out. <laughs> nope. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Please state your name for the record first. My name is proceed. David Smith. I live in Northeast Philadelphia. I've been there all my life. Um, I finally got a place um, after it was six months. I'm an autistic man. And I honestly, um, what I went through, I ended up almost committing suicide over it. I, with a lot of places, would not take me. We went through place after place after place. I thought that I was going to end up in a very bad neighborhood or living in a group home, because that's another thing we got to address with people with disabilities, with autism, Met high functioning mental illness. Doesn't mean I'm the good doctor and I can work 40 hours a week. That's because we got these MAGA Republicans in, in office that don't give a damn about people like me. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. But, uh, and I, I and, um, it's what we need to do is take a look at the, the standards, um, right? And I do think for disabled people, the waiting period should be indefinite, meaning you got that much time the rest of your life if you have to. I also think that it the houses need to be mandatory. And I mean mandatory, and people need to go to jail if they don't take it. Because um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for going off script here. Because people like me, it's could be life and death, literally. I do not want to end up in a group home. I like my freedom. I like to be able to come and go as I please. Just because I'm high, just because I'm high function, I, I can't afford it. I can't afford twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month. And I think the standards shouldn't be eleven twenty two. It should be twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred. And I honestly think that what they need to do is start. I'm going to say something that no one's ever thought about, and I know that you're only city council, but it should be noted. I think the United Nations not needs to get involved and hold sanctions against the country and say, you do not supply how we do it in other countries. Why not us? You need to say, you know what? You don't supply housing to the most needy. I'm, I'm not talking able body. I'm talking disabled senior citizens. Then we're going to hold sanctions. I bet you that would end housing. That would end the housing crisis like if they did that. And I do. I think it needs to be an arrestable offense if they don't I'm sorry, I know it sounds a little harsh, but we need to come down like an iron fist on some of these people. The next thing we need to do, here's how you do help landlords. You tell them, okay, if their rejections happen to be, okay, but we have to fix up this stuff and all that, perhaps give them a loan, perhaps give them tax abatement or something like that. So maybe they can say, oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll consider it. But something needs to be done for people like me. People like me, I almost ended up, I, you don't know what I went through. My mom and I ended up with arguments and everything. I finally found this person here. If I did not find her, I would not have a place to live and I would be in a group home. I'm sorry, I'm tired of this. It's gotta be done and it's gotta be done now and it has to be done with, and, 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 if you, and, and to the activists, we need protests, but not a thousand people here and there. We need millions of people protesting for housing. I mean, we're not leaving until you do it. And if you don't do it, then you might as well resign. That's what we need. Sorry, but I needed to tell you that. Don't be sorry, Mr. Gray. Um, you, you know, I think this conversation has to be real. It has to show um, the real impacts um, that, you know, a struggle to find housing or inability to, um, to fairly access housing has on people's lives, right? Many people are landing in hospitals or in jails when at root 
is an affordable housing issue or dying, right? or dying um, like you laid out. And so when That's we say a human right, that's yep. why I said mm -hmm. that if they discriminate and that person dies, then that person should have the right to a or that person gets sick for it. Then that person uh, can sue that landlord and become a millionaire themselves, because that's the type of uh, thing we need to do. I think that they if they see that there's consequences and I mean harsh consequences, maybe they'll be more willing to do it because they'll be too afraid not to. Yeah, thank you for drawing that out for for us. We appreciate you. Um, Deanna Roundtree, I see you there. Um, can you, are you able to state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes, my name is Deanna Roundtree. Um, I'll start my testimony um, with back in 2007, um, I had moved into Barton Village with my two young children. Um, oh. I moved over there in 2007. Um, I lived over at Barton for about 10, 11 years. Um, I got my voucher um, 2020. It took once I got the voucher, you know, I was very happy. Um, what I didn't know is the extent of um, what it meant to have the voucher. Once you get the voucher, it's, you're kind of left out on your own to um, search for a home and uh, deal with um, the remarks from landlords. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I went through a lot having the voucher. Um, I had landlords say to me, um, are you able to afford the place that I was looking, looking at? Um, and I have a, a the opposite type of situation. I saw a lot of houses um, where landlords um, said they would accept the voucher, but once they saw me in person, um, that flew out the window. That flew out the window. Once they saw me in person, that I was a, a, a black woman, um, that was the end of um, a lot of searches um, that I had to deal with um, having my voucher. Um, during the time that I was at Bartram Village, um, like Ms. Waller stated, um, we needed over. Oh, still need a lot of help over there, especially cameras. My son had, a year before I got my voucher, um, my, my youngest son um, was shot in the back, literally across the street um, from Barton Village. Um, there were well, I was told there were no cameras. It was hard to um, get in touch with um, investigators, which I found that shooting wasn't even investigated. Um, it's just the the other thing with that having the voucher is um, the houses that are listed online, um, they're not livable homes. I literally saw a home that smelled like gas was leaking. 
there were no markets, no stores. I asked the person that was showing the home, um, where's the nearest market? She, she told me she did not go. And proceeded to um, ask me I saw a house where the washer and dryer was in the bathroom. These houses that were on um, the list um, for sexual vouchers are ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I finally found a house, had no pictures. Um, I kind of went out on the limb and said, I don't have anything to lose. And found a landlord that was willing to take my voucher. Um, not everyone, um, Not everyone um, is fortunate. A lot of folks in Bartram Village that I did know that have received their vouchers gave it up. Strictly because two bedrooms is hard to find. That's number one. For, for us residents that um, only needed two bedrooms, it's not happening. It's not happening. I think the vouchers need to be changed or updated or something because um, two bedrooms is unlikely to find. And um, I just want to thank you guys for um, having me, hearing me speak. Um, I really hope that there are some changes. Um, I do want to say one thing, um, something that Ms. Waller stated, mm -hmm. um, the voucher does not have, um, an amount on the actual, um, paper. Um, I'm not sure, um, why that is, but I believe that it should be. And I also, uh, believe that, um, um, that the voucher should be a, a lot higher because, you know, the world we live in, everything is going up. Um, for working class folks, you know, our money is being divided. And, you know, the first thing, you got to have a roof over your head and, you know, everything else. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm very grateful that you guys listen to my testimony, um, I do uh, feel like it's like really depressing. Um, uh, so I understand what the last gentleman was stating um, because I was willing to quit and give up my voucher also. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ms. Roundtree. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing um, your story and for really highlighting how all of this is tied together, right? A lack of affordable housing, gun violence, the toll that that takes on people. Um, and, you know, I thank you for your recommendations on the voucher program, but also on changes, as we heard before, um, that need to be made in terms of our investments in the public housing sites that we have. Um, and I also wanted to say, I don't know how helpful it would be, but if um, we'll follow up to get your information, because you should have a good understanding um, of the investigation into your son's shooting. And so if that is, um, we'd like to follow up with you on that, if that's something that you want um, with PPD to get a sense of what exactly happened and who's responsible for that investigation. That'll be great. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. Um, are there other uh, members of the committee that have questions or comments from this for this panel? 
Ms. Shirls, will you please call the next panel to testify? Sherry Thomas, Jesse Keel, Aaron Blair. Sherry Thomas, are you there and connected? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Gautier. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Um, I'm Sherry Thomas. I am the Director of Housing at the Legal Clinic for the Disabled. The Legal Clinic for the Disabled, otherwise known as LCD, is a direct legal services agency. We serve low-income individuals living with physical and mental health disabilities, and we are a partner in the Philadelphia Eviction Prevention Project. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of resolution number 221031. Many of LCD's clients are housing choice voucher holders, and many of them, due to their disability, live on fixed incomes. So this subsidy is one of the few ways they can afford safe and suitable housing. In theory, sorry, one, one second. Ms. Roundtree. Ms. Roundtree? Yes, I'm sorry. Can we have you go on mute? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks again for being here today. Proceed. Okay, thank you so much. Um, as I was saying, many of LCD's clients are voucher holders and many of them due to their disability are on fixed incomes. So the voucher is really one of the very few ways that um, folks with physical and mental health disabilities are able to access safe and suitable housing. Um, however, what we found in our work is that at every stage, there's opportunity for source of income discrimination, whether that's explicit or implicit. So finalizing a lease, as we heard today, using a voucher can take several months. This includes locating the landlord who accepts the voucher, undergoing an inspection, negotiating the rent, and then finally actually signing the lease. And every stage of this process provides an opportunity for implicit or explicit source of income discrimination. Finding a landlord who accepts the housing voucher can feel like finding a needle in a haystack. Renters use websites such as affordablehousing.com, which is what is linked um, through PHA. But what we have heard from multiple renters is that that website is not accurate. Um, often they find that um, properties that are listed as available are actually unavailable once they um, find out if they even get a call back. Um, and this is especially frustrating for people living with physical and mental disabilities. Um, living with a disability, it often means less time and um, oftentimes less ability to um, conduct a housing search without assistance. Um, people with um, people living with disabilities often spend considerable time performing day-to-day -day activities and accessing health care. Um, and so this stretches out the time it takes to find housing. And we heard in Mr. Gray's testimony that the time limits on being able to use a voucher is really detrimental for people living with disabilities. Once someone actually locates a the property, they must still apply. And at this stage, there is, they're subject to just, um, discretion. Recently, we had a LCD client who applied for housing, but once the um, landlord found out that they were using a voucher, they were told they were no longer looking at applications, although he was able to submit one. Finally, um, or actually next, the property must undergo an inspection. Um, and this can take several weeks to complete. Um, we do appreciate that um, the program doesn't want to fund um, properties that have habitability issues. However, the way the current rental market is going, it rewards speed. Um, suitable properties are snatched up within days of them coming onto the market. Um, you know, we've had clients reach this inspection stage and then landlords back out at that point, um, saying that it's taking too long. And this distinction of speed between voucher holders and those who don't hold a voucher severely puts people at a disadvantage. Um, and it gives an opportunity for, um, this is an implicit discrimination of an entire group being discriminated against simply because of how the rent is going to be paid. And at that point, someone has already invested several weeks looking at one property, and now they have to start from ground zero. Lastly, after a property once passes inspection, the landlord must then accept the rent limits that are actually placed by the subsidy. And we've seen at that stage too, where landlords have 
um, backed out at the final stage. Um, and this is largely due to, you know, rents increasing um, exponentially uh, due to the absence of rent control, as well as the limitations that PHA has on subsidizing higher rents. Um, voucher holders are once again treated differently than those who are non-voucher holders simply because of the way their rent is being paid. So this is just a small sample of the challenges that we see um, as practitioners with our clients. Um, at every stage, um, all four of these stages, there's an opportunity for explicit and implicit discrimination and a distinction between a voucher holder and a non-voucher holder. Um, so LCD truly appreciates this committee's recognition of these issues and we're looking forward to working on equitable solutions together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, um, you know, that was really uh, informational, especially how you broke down how this discrimination happens at each um, stage at the pro of the process. I think that's very helpful for us. It will be very helpful for us as we try to solve this issue. Um, thank you. So thank you. Um, Jesse Keel, are you there and connected? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Can you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes. Well, thank you, um, Jamie and the rest of the team for hosting this testimony. I find it to be such a vital um, conversation, um, especially as a person who is a young adult um, who currently holds a voucher and have peers who also have held vouchers. Um, and the conversations that we have, right, in regards to like the process for us. Um, and so I wanted to speak on uh, the, like ha us having like a streamlined system or and, and, and software platform uh, for voucher support. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, those who have vouchers, uh, ho those who obtain vouchers that may not be connected to an organization um, and need support along the way in regards to questions that come up from landlords, questions that they come up with themselves that they're unable to, um, that they're unable to be able, you know, to vocalize when going a part of the pro that process. So uh, it seems that the process of vouchers is very confusing for both recipients and landlords. Recipients are unsure of how to navigate the conversations with landlords who claim that they don't accept a vouchers and are not participating in the quote unquote voucher program. Um, and so this was something uh, that has come up a lot in conversations with um, landlords where it's like, how much is your voucher for? Um, and no one has a clear answer for that. And then also, in regards to you know this 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 concept of a, a voucher program and what I've come to realize that there is no voucher program. It's just folks have a voucher and it is considered a source of income, right? And so even as even literally just today, I reached out to someone. They reached back out um, and and I mentioned the voucher. That, oh, we're not part of the voucher program. I'm just like there is no program. It's just are you a, are you Happy, happy to accept this voucher or not. Um, so uh, there's no clarity on the timeline of voucher assistance. So on one hand, vouchers are said to be considered income, as I just mentioned. Yet, how are we able to submit these on applications um, as as a source of income? So that way, there is that accountability. If if an applicant is denied for income. And then it's like, okay, well now I clearly have a case that this is income discrimination. Um, vouchers currently do not meet the current uh, market value. So in areas um, that are up and coming um, and decent for decent and habitable spaces, um, we have Kensington, we have Fishtown, right? Um, where they have new, you know, new housing. Um, and the city for that specific zip code is only willing to pay no more than $950, yet the market rent in this area is $1,200 plus. Um, and I've even had a conversation with uh, property management from that area that they mentioned that PHA has directly denied a rent offer from the landlord um, that, that, that didn't, you know, align with, you know, theirs or even in negotiating a price, you know, PHA was not willing to budge because of the the 
um, their, what they consider to be market rent. Young people are facing discrimination now more than ever before who lack previous rental history, who may or may not have co-signer support. And so even in those cases where you have property management and landlords who say they that they you know outright do accept vouchers the screening criteria um the screening criteria is not um realistic and it's not reflective of the demographic of people who are holding these vouchers right so in understanding that the demographic of those who have these vouchers are pos- most likely not coming from a financially outstanding background um, and so what can that screening criteria look like um, that is, you know, different, but still, you know, adhering to um, the comfort level of landlords? Um, I, myself, and young people have had direct interactions with property management who outright ignore our inquiries once we receive, once we mention a voucher. Um, and young people and other voucher holders are being... Uh, faced with limited options and forced to live in areas that are unsafe. So, uh, I, I personally, uh, have reached out to, um, I personally reached out to, and I'm going to name drop because I don't, I don't mind. It is what it is. Um, I've reached out to an agency called rentals 215, um, that explicitly accepts vouchers. They are, they are actually in the pod mission. Um, software and i was ignored uh i had a friend who reached out uh separately i had them reach out as a test right and that my friend was responded to immediately um yet i've also did a follow-up with them and their assistant and still have continued to be ignored um just to kind of you know confirm my suspicions right and then recently, um, I know OHS has praised Olden Property Management for re- receiving and accepting vouchers and having a partnership. However, it seems to be that they're only accepting vouchers for specific locations, which is just confusing to me. Um, it's either you accept the vouchers or not, and it shouldn't be, um, you know, contingent upon this location or that location, because then you're saying, okay, well, in a sense, that's what it seems like is that you're, you're redlining me into certain, um, an area that you deem habitable for someone of my demographic, of financial demographic. Um, we ask for the city council to increase funding that is allocated for homeless youth and young adults, to curate a system of accountability towards PHA, OHS, and landlords in order to protect voucher holders, potential tenants, and even landlords as well. So we need support in upholding the Renters Access Act in ways in which the screening requirements for voucher holders are different. Um, another solution would be a reevaluation of the city's zoning of market value to match the current mar- um, needs market so that voucher holders are not being impacted by the rise of gentrification and being um, you know, susceptible to areas that are unsafe Right. Um, another solution would be to maybe create a housing agency that acts as a rental agency specific for people with vouchers to be able to conduct special screening that eliminates that process um, uh, outside of, you know, outside of this, you know, uh, fic- fictional agency, um, because this application process for voucher holders is stressful, isn't it's discriminatory. Another solution would be clarity across the board for voucher holders on extensions that they can rely on. Um, yeah, I, I know I'm currently being told that like my extension is not um, an option, even though my case manager explicitly, you, you know, let them know like, hey, um, I I gave her notice of the voucher late because I, I seen it late. And so can we extend it? And it was just met with like, oh, well, you know, there's a grace period. And like, that's not, that's not cool at all. Um, and so I'm still trying to fit my, my voucher actually extends this week. And so I'm trying to figure out if there's an option, um, it expires this week, my apologies. So I'm trying to figure out, um, is there an option available for me to have an extension? Um, and lastly, if we could come up with some working group solutions, um, that include a reevaluation of landlord requirements when it comes to some of the unrealistic inspections um, that is held by PHA when, let's be real, we do have some HUD 
specific um, properties that they themselves kind of don't meet their own inspection expectations. So thank you so much for letting me speak on behalf of myself and other young people like myself who are being met with um, housing discrimination and facing homelessness. Um, yeah, bye. Thank you, Jesse. Um, thanks for your your testimony. Thanks for your work that I know is fueled by your own personal um, experience. And um, I want to follow up with you, if possible, after the hearing to see if we can get you any assistance on your uh, individual issue with respect to uh, your voucher uh, extension. I appreciate you, Councilwoman Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Councilmember Brooks. Just a like, point of clarification, am I hearing that folks do not know how much their voucher actually is, or there's no document that they receive saying how much the voucher is while they're searching for an apartment? I think Ms. Roundtree talked about that. Also, Ms. Waller talked about that. And and so do, do one of you want to want to answer that? Is it that it's just not printed on the voucher, or do you not know? Uh, is there nothing that tells you? So it's it's not, this is Jesse Kill, it's not printed on the voucher at all, as well as there, um, if you don't have a case manager, you uh, typically you should receive a document that has a zoning of how much they're willing to pay depending on which zip code. Um, but as, I, as I've mentioned before, if it's being submitted as a source of income and there's no number on it, then it can be denied and as a source of income and not be accountable to income discrimination because there's no, there's no number on it, so. Okay, and then my other question is, you, you, I think this is Jesse Keel. Um, you talked about the systems that are in place to assist in the search. I think you and someone else spoke about this earlier. So just for clarity, there is a website or database that they send you to, but the information is not accurate or usable in order for you to find appropriate housing. Am I correct? Yes, typically. However, in, in most cases, these uh these resources aren't sent immediately, um, but and, and and if they are, like it's something that like you have to like kind of continue to pull teeth and request, um, and you get. And I I know I personally have received different resources from different people, so it's not streamlined, it's not centralized, um, and then as well as when it is received, these things are not updated and accurate. Um. um yes. <laughs> Sherry Thomas from Legal Clinic for the Disabled. I also mentioned that in my testimony. Um, so there is a website called affordablehousing.com um, that we have heard tenants say that it's not up to date. Um, and going to the, um, the amount of rent that would be listed on the voucher so that final stage, my understanding is that there's a negotiation that happens between PHA and the landlord. So um, the landlord would need to accept whatever that negotiated um, amount is um, before they lease up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is, uh, thank you, council member. Um, Aaron Blair, um, can you state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Hi, my name is Erin Blair. I am the Director of Nurse Advocacy and Resources for the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium. Uh, in this role, I support, support maternal child health home visitors, serving families in multiple programs across uh, the city of Philadelphia um, with children uh, from pregnancy until their children reach school age. Um, Thank you so much for hosting today's hearing. I really appreciate the attention to this um, devastating and often overlooked issue that blatantly flies in the face of legal precedent that's been set many, many years ago. Um, we've heard a lot of stats and stuff like that. I'm going to change up my mm -hmm. testimony a little bit to more directly speak to the health implications mm -hmm. of extended housing insecurity when yeah. folks are on vouchers. 
Um, but I, I think that, you know, um, pregnant and parenting people are at especially high rates of um, how, like, experience housing insecurity at higher rates than many other groups of people for many reasons, but discrimination kind of tops out the list oftentimes. Yeah. Um, and you put on top of that uh, a voucher, it gives landlords even more recourse to choose not to rent a home to families. Um, Housing insecurity and homelessness are responsible for a host of long-term, highly expensive, costly to taxpayer health outcomes. And in terms of social emotional um, outcomes, like we heard about from Mr. Sorry, I lost. Um, from Mr. one of Gray. the <laughs> yes earlier, um, as well as just the the. How do you bond with a baby when you are couch surfing and trying to figure out a safe place to sleep to sleep each night? How do you get your child to daycare each day when you've been forced into a voucher that is or a shelter that is an hour and 15 minutes via public transportation away from your child's regular um, child care or early childhood center? Um, there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily think about as the costs of housing insecurity, our shelter system, homelessness, that um, one of the best indicators for heart disease in adults is early childhood homelessness and, and trauma as children. So when we're talking about intergenerational long-term needs. Um, but in my role um, working I also direct a small direct grant family support fund, and I regularly engage with landlords around the challenges that they experience and also just trying to get them to let me give them money. I have to fight with landlords to let me give them money <laughs> because they're so anxious about taking funds after the pandemic and negative experiences associated with the multiple phases of rental assistance, as well as dealing with promises of money that never came through, like some of the things that we issued in the sort of four part um, housing voucher acceptance thing. Some of the landlords, the rare unicorn landlords that I meet that are willing to work with vouchers still express a lot of frustration around waiting sometimes weeks to months to finally get a payment when they're working with a person to get them into housing. And it's nothing to do with them. They're waiting on an inspection for almost a month with like a second inspection or a follow up or things like that that just prevent everyone. But the other issue is when you consider that the families that oftentimes are receiving these vouchers and waiting on these units, they are taking up spaces in emergency housing that need to be available for people that are newly becoming homeless. There are families that are being separated uh, because there's not adequate space in shelters for them. There are a lot of young people that are choosing dangerous housing situations because there's not adequate space in shelters. Survival sex is a real thing. It's a thing that a lot of people end up choosing to be able to have a roof over their head and an address to receive mail at so they can continue their benefits and get the supports that they need. I want that to really sink in. It's something I see regularly. It's something I see regularly with people who are supporting young children. And um, I think that it's fair for property owners to be concerned about never receiving a payment in the first place. You know, I, I think that oftentimes we hear about landlords that are as bad actors because they're not following through. But this is a scenario and a situation where we really need to examine accountability on PHA and accountability on the city services that are um, tasked with making sure that funds are accessible rapid and meet the needs of people. If I had a job and I only got my job accomplished six out of the 10 times I tried to, I probably wouldn't have a job very long. Why are we allowing city services to function in a way where it only functions 60% of the time? And frankly, I feel that 60% is a very generous number because if you think about the number of families that are informally refused 
um, housing with voucher systems. That's that's the ones that make an application, right? We're talking about a lot that aren't. So I just want people to think that we are working really hard to improve maternal child health in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Black women in the city of Philadelphia die at exorbitant rates, and they also experience house homelessness at far higher rates than their peers. And um, I work with the Philadelphia Homes for Youth Coalition. I recommend anyone who's interested in you learning more about youth housing issues to join that coalition, follow up with Jesse, follow up with me. Please, please, please come hear from young people directly about what solutions will work for them and what issues. A lot of young people I know with vouchers would not like to live alone, but they are not able to use their voucher if somebody else is not on, if everyone that's gonna live in a household isn't on the voucher, then landlords don't know how to navigate that. But traditionally young people have had a much easier time um, like when you think about college housing, it's four people living in one house together. That doesn't really exist for young people aging out of foster care for young people with vouchers. Um, and Frankly, it's just 100% unacceptable that young people are allowed to age out of our foster care system directly into homelessness. They are required by law to have transitional uh, plan in place for uh, transitioning to adulthood. And 21 is not high enough. Young people today live with their families for longer. And that means that we should have um, systems in place that support people for longer. Um, I'm trying to stay within my time. You guys have my written testimony. There's lots of other good stuff in there, but I will open it up for questions and other folks that might have a uh, few things to say. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, we really appreciate you adding to what the um, the tenants here did, right? Um, focusing on how this issue impacts real people um, in, in their everyday lives. Um, and we appreciate that. Um, are there uh, any questions or comments for this panel from members of the committee? Okay, Ms. Sherls, can you call the next panel or witness to testify? From the Office of Homeless Services, we have Liz Hirsch from PHA. We have Kelvin Jeremiah and Brett Holden. And from the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, we have Kiki. Wonderful. Um, Liz Hirsch, I see you there. Can you yes, state yes. your name? Uh, Good afternoon. <laughs> um, hi, hi everybody. Uh, council member, uh, Madam Chair, um, it might be helpful to have Kelvin uh, testify first because a lot okay. of what we do actually follows the um, protocols of PHA. Um, so I think he's probably better situated to provide that context. Um, and then I'm uh, happy to go from there. Thank you so much. Kelvin, thank you so much for joining us today. My my pleasure. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Gautier, Vice Chair Jones, and other members of the committee. Uh, I am Kelvin Jeremiah. I'm the president and CEO of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Um, as you may be aware, PHA is, of course, the largest landlord uh, in Pennsylvania, we provide housing to over 19,500 low income families through the Housing Choice Voucher Program, what we refer to as HCV, uh, a program that is formally known as uh, quote unquote the Section A program. Uh, PHA is incredibly pleased to see Council's interest in protecting voucher holders from unfair rental practices and housing discrimination. As I'm sure Council knows, a 2021 decision by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down the City of Pittsburgh Source of Income Ordinance in a unanimous decision. According to the decision, and I quote, nothing in state statute permits the city to enact legislation requiring residential landlords to participate in an otherwise voluntary federal housing subsidy. While PHA agrees that the HCV program was intended to be voluntary, we strongly believe uh, and PHA wholly supports all city efforts as well as the state to codify protection for renters to ensure landlords cannot refuse to rent based on one's source of income. 
As I mentioned earlier, PHS supports 19,500 families in the HCV program. The average household size uh, is three, and the average annual household income is approximately $16,000 while within the poverty guidelines. Uh, this is itself a contributing factor, we believe, in families' ability to quickly find and rent safe, quality, affordable housing in our city. The average number of days to secure a unit before it is submitted to PHA for approval is approximately 70 days. That being said, however, the majority of voucher holders, approximately 75%, who find an HCV unit are leased within four months of voucher issuance. The resolution mentioned that the rate of rejections of tenant-based vouchers is high in neighborhoods with low poverty rates. Um, PHA cannot, uh, I, I think it mentioned that it's about 83% of landlords refusing to accept vouchers. PHA unfortunately cannot corroborate that figure as we do not keep data on rejections or refusal by landlords to accept a voucher and participate or participate in the pro program. However, PHA does advise and ask clients to contact the HCV team if a landlord or owner declines to rent or rejects them as a voucher holder. Unfortunately, PHA receives very little feedback on these occurrences from our clients. Nonetheless, when PHA clients do report to PHA, our team will engage with proposed landlords conducting outreach to educate them and the, on the program and its benefits. To this end, PHA has implemented a number, a number of incentives and an assurance program to entice private landlords to participate in the HCV program. In, two, in 2021, PHA introduced new monetary incentives for Philadelphia landlords either newly joined in the program or who are adding units to the HCV program. The incentives include time-limited signing bonuses ranging anywhere from $300 to $1,000 for opportunity neighborhoods, as well as the owner assurance fund. Uh, let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about the owner assurance fund because I think it's probative to the discussion that we're having, uh, Madam Chair. The owner assurance fund, which is currently offered to approve landlords, is designed to protect property owners from unexpected damages beyond the normal wear and tear. Through outreach and engagement, PHA found that many private landlords were hesitant to participate in the program due to the belief that renters with vouchers might cause damage to units beyond, beyond the average rental market client. PHA, for its part, recognize this that its population that the population that we serve is vulnerable and often comes with a host of other needs that non-market rate that market rate tenants typically may not wear and tear is sometimes not the same as private market in the private market as landlords we saw that implementing the owner assurance fund was a critical component to responding to the owners um, request and concerns regarding their participation in programs. Under the terms of the program, PHA reimburses property owners who participate in the H HCV program up to $2,500 to help cover repair expenses, net of any security deposits withheld for damages. Through the end of 2022, over 2,500 new units were added to the HCV program, and PHA paid out over a million dollars in incentives to HCV landlords. PHA, it's important to note, does not receive any, any specific federal, state, or city funding for this initiative. Instead, PHA appropriated this funds in, an F, in our ongoing effort to reduce barriers faced by um, recipients of the Housing Choice Voucher. With these incentive programs and continued outreach and marketing to landlords by PHA and its within the Office of Homeless Services, over 900 new HCV landlords have rented a unit to a PHA voucher holder since 2021. 
PHA now has over 5,200 participating landlords renting to voucher holders in the city, up from about 4,000 or 4,500 in 2017. Another area of focus for PHA to increase HCV participation over the past decade has been our housing opportunity program, what we call HOP, which was an, L, which was an early iteration of what has now been promoted nationally by HUD as its mobility program. HOP is a housing mobility initiative aimed at assisting families participating in HCV program to explore housing choices and to move to opportunity areas within Philadelphia and surrounding communities. Opportunity areas offer, as you all know, more desirable life opportunities for HCV families, including a better quality of life and housing, diverse neighborhoods, and across uh, and access to better schools, uh, nearby shopping, and of course, increased employment opportunity. In 2022, PHA assisted, in 2022 alone, PHA assisted over 50 families to use their voucher to find and move to quality housing in top rated neighborhoods. In another initiative to encourage moves to higher opportunity areas, PHA now use, uh, PHA, PHA now bases our voucher payment standard on HUD small area fair market rents, SAFMRs as it's referred to. In contrast to the previously used citywide fair market rents, uh, the SAFMRs are zip code based, which enables PHA to offer higher subsidy levels in higher opportunity areas, that is areas with lower poverty rates and better access to job opportunities and neighborhood amenities. PHA organizes its SAFMRs based payment standards into five groupings, with group five representing the highest opportunity area as uh, you can as can be seen from the attachment provided in my testimony, the current subsidy levels in group five are significantly higher than it is in group one, for example. PHA's maximum voucher subsidy level for a two bedroom apartment in group five neighborhood is approximately $880 higher than it is in group one. Even with these higher payment standards, voucher holders struggle to find decent housing in all areas of the city. High opportunity areas present unique challenges, including landlords' unwillingness to participate in the program. Voucher holders' lack of familiarity with and access to these areas and other factors. However, progress is being made, Madam Chair. The increased payment standards that PHA implemented in October 2022 have already resulted in 95 new owners leasing units to voucher holders in groups five, in groups four and five in recent month, months. In total, over 1,800, over 1,800 PHA holders now live in group four and five areas. Much more work needs to be done in that regard. While PHA does acknowledge the potential discrimination on the basis of source of income, I would like to close with comments on the importance of credit worthiness, something that is often used by landlords as the basis for not renting to Section 8 or Housing Choice voucher recipients. It is critical, I think, to differentiate between denials due to source of income and those as a result of credit. Credit is Credit is an important component of the private market's decision to rent, as you know. PHA does not conduct credit checks, and credit for PHA would never pre prevent a household from receiving a voucher. Yet it does, as I'm sure you know, impact a household's ability to secure rental units in the private, in the private market. PHA has played a major role in the relocation, for example, of university townhomes resident in administering our tenant protection vouchers and assisting residents with securing units and landlords approval through HCV program. Even with PHA's assistance, many residents have had a difficult time securing unit due to their credit rating and or rental payment history. 
for example, PHL located an, an owner in Winfield section of West Philadelphia, willing to rent to voucher holders from University City townhomes. Five residents were referred by PHA, and, and of those five, only two were accepted as owner's management company had to reject the other three due to the low credit scores. We have to address, we have to address that issue. Um, and so it often is, frankly, a, a guise to reject um, HGV participants. Lastly, working in parallel to codify source of income rules at the state level, PHA asks City Council to also consider the impact credit counseling and other credit repair might have in improving low income families' ability to find and secure safe, decent, and affordable quality housing in our city. Thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions that the committee may have. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Jeremiah, um, for your testimony, but also for your work. You know, my office has worked very closely with yours um, on, you know, helping tenants to access vouchers, um, you know, as it relates to the townhomes, as it relates to West Park, um, and even more broadly. And we appreciate you, um, and we appreciate the things that you have done proactively to try to make the, the program work better. And I want you to know that City Council aims to be your partner um, in making this work um, as well as it can um, for everyone in Philadelphia who needs vouchers to access safe and affordable housing. Um, if you could stay on, that'd be wonderful. I'm going Going to have the other panelists go and then we have questions for all of you. Absolutely. Miss um, Hirsch, um, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Liz Hirsch, um, the director of the city's Office of Homeless Services. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you, um, uh, committee chair, member uh, Gautier and members of the committee for holding this hearing and for focusing on this critical issue. Um, it's uh, we were very, very excited uh, when the American Rescue Plan passed and the city got 863 vouchers to add on to the 19,000 and some that PH has, but that were dedicated to people experiencing homelessness. Um, and I think our our people have um, I mean, 68 percent are leased up, but it's been tremendously challenging. And uh, the source of income discrimination, uh, racial discrimination, and also discrimination against people who are Megan's Law offenders um, continue to be huge barriers for people. So I'm uh, very appreciative that you're recognizing this issue and focusing on um, understanding it better and what might be done. Um, I also really appreciated some of the early testimony um, about solutions, and I thought some uh, very innovative solutions were raised. Um, I, I um, Early on in my career in Philadelphia, I was the executive director of the Tenants Action Group, and we did fair housing enforcement, um, especially around um, racial, um, racial discrimination and presence of children. And uh, we did find that testing is absolutely critical. It's really the best way. And so I was really glad to hear the peep that there were some resources going to testing and that that's something that might be expanded. And that combines with public education, I think are both great ideas um, and uh, the, I think, private right of action and the extended time. One of the things that um, one of the speakers said was that when people are in a housing crisis and looking for a place, the idea of getting legal assistance is very overwhelming because they're in a situation where they just need to find a place to live. So having enough time once they get settled to go back and look at legal recourse, I think is, um, you know, is a really important piece of this. Um, the Office of Homeless Services um, administers uh, two rental assistance programs, uh, Supportive Housing, um, which has uh, about 2,800 units, and Rapid Rehousing, which last year was about uh, 591 households. Uh, these are both subsidy programs. Um, some of the Rapid Rehousing is entirely tenant-based. Um, and uh, what the we contracted out to a series of providers um, and those providers do pro do give um, uh, the 
applicants the names of three units where they might be able to live. How do they do this? Um, it's really relationship building. It's very, very hands on. And um, we find that when oh, that the most important thing, well, there's a number of really important things. One is, as somebody mentioned, getting paid on time. Um, and another is having somebody to, at the other end of the phone. So if and when there's a problem, there's somebody to call who's going to step in and resolve it. And so um, in our programs, there are service providers who do try who work with the landlord and work with the residents uh, to the extent possible. I'm not going to tell you that it's a perfect system. Uh, people do our tenants do have choices about what services they accept. Um, we can't make somebody accept services, um, but we have found that those relationships uh, between the landlords and the providers uh, does help pave the way for others. That and as Kelvin mentioned, um, the kind of the loss contingency fund um, so that if they do experience damages that um, they are able to be made whole. Um, in August of 2021, we did a, a survey of landlords um, and 400 landlords responded. 77% um, said they did not rent to um, housing choice voucher holders. 82% said they didn't even know about the program. Um, and 62% just on its face said they weren't interested in learning. So I think that was really, really um, brought home to us in concrete terms, kind of the uphill battle um, that we were uh, fighting in order to make sure that um, people who are exiting homelessness, who have this very precious resource of a subsidy, had a way of being successful in their in their housing search. Um, so uh, thanks uh, in part to PHA, uh, we do have housing navigators. Those having housing navigators actually work with the housing case managers who are responsible for helping people find the units. Uh, we did, as somebody mentioned, also establish PAD mission. Um, and it's open to any um, landlord who wants to work in partnership with the city. Um, it is um, updated daily. Um, so if there's, you know, sometimes units go really fast. Uh, we do our best to keep it updated, but we want to know if there's problems with it or inconsistencies and in information so we can fix that. Currently, we have 150 landlords with over 200 units ranging from efficiencies to five bedrooms in PAD mission. Um, and then those again are for the providers to help their participants find units. Um, we most recently, what we have um, begun to do is to establish a landlord gateway um, led by Ebony Williams, who is our landlord affairs, director of landlord affairs, who unfortunately was unable, unable to be with us today. Uh, she brought together 16 public agencies to create um, this landlord gateway which will serve as a one-stop shop for property owners and managers to access all the city's various rental assistance programs. As it stands now, if you are a property manager or owner, rental property manager or owner, who wants to do something about the affordable housing crisis or help people end homelessness, and we find that many actually do, um, it's very, very hard to access our the city's system. Um, so we are developing a website, a web-based application, a dedicated unit to work with landlords and provide navigational support. And this, um, the, we are working together with Planning and Development, Revenue, PHA, the Register of Wales, wh Wills, not Wales, um, DBH, IDS, LNI, Revenue, Commerce, DHS, the School District, and uh, PHDC. At, to make it easier and more accessible for those property owners and managers to work with the system and access our um, rental assistance programs and be part of the solution. Uh, so with that, I will stop. And um, of course, we'll be available for questions. And uh, thank you again for um, bringing light to this uh, critical issue. Um, and we stand ready to do whatever we can to help and support um, in trying to solve this problem. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Hirsch. We are appreciative of the work that you do every day to end and prevent homelessness. And um, we're appreciative of your partnership as we try to make um, the voucher program more accessible um, and more, even more useful um, for people in the city. Um, Kia Gee, are you there and connected? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you okay. please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Yes. Hi. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Gautier and members of the Committee on Housing, Neighborhood Development and Homelessness. I'm Kia Gee. I am the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to testify today um, at this hearing uh, initiated by Resolution 221031. Um, and thank you to the panel who have testified so far. Um, their testimony has been very informative and uh, we take the feedback constructively. Um, as the city's official civil rights agency, uh, enforcement agency, we are tasked with um, investigating complaints of discrimination, uh, whether that be in employment, public accommodation, housing, or real property. Um, since 1980, the Fair Practices Ordinance has prohibited discrimination based on source of income, uh, including public assistance and housing assistance programs, such as housing choice vouchers, so that families can, in fact, um, choose to live where they desire, in neighborhoods that they desire. Um, in addition, since uh, 2002, it has been unlawful to uh, give false or misleading information with regard to properties, um, such as representing that a property is not available for inspection, sale, or rental when in fact it is. It is also unlawful to treat tenants who use Section 8 vouchers differently um, in terms of the price, terms, and conditions, and privileges of tenancy based on the fact that they are a Section 8 voucher user or any other source of income. When property owners refuse to rent, sell, or lease to families who utilize housing vouchers, they are engaging in unlawful conduct that is a direct violation of the Fair Practices Ordinance. I am here today because despite um, the undeniable benefit of the program, um, there are still families who are unlawfully denied the opportunity to rent in neighborhoods of their choosing. Uh, over the last five years, the commission has received dozens of complaints against landlords and brokers across the city um, of unlawful discrimination based on source of income. Uh, the commission has garnered over $20,000 in damages for these complainants um, who have faced source of income discrimination. And we have also successfully negotiated resolutions in which landlords agree to adopt uh, written policies against discrimination, receive annual training on compliance with the Fair Practices Ordinance, and encourage tenants with housing, housing choice vouchers to apply. Despite these gains, um, there is a correlation uh, between source of income discrimination uh, in preferred neighborhoods and increased concentration of voucher users in distressed neighborhoods. Uh, there are several steps that we believe could be taken to strengthen protection for those experiencing source of income discrimination. First, we would recommend that legislation um, be passed that expressly prohibits housing providers from making, publishing, circulating, issuing, or displaying any written communication or advertisement containing language such as no Section 8, not Section 8 approved, um, not set up for Section 8, uh, and provide, as the other uh, panelists said, private right of action um, for those who are impacted. Second, uh, we recommend making it unlawful for housing providers to refuse to cooperate with minor administrative uh, paperwork or requirements for the Housing Choice Voucher Program, such, um, such as completing routine paperwork or allowing an inspection of their property. Um, finally, we understand the magnitude of or the lack of resources that exist, but we will continue to use the resources that we have available to us to partner with um, elected officials, community partners, uh, and others to facilitate proactive uh, public education um, public education campaigns 
that clearly explain tenant rights and landlord responsibilities under this law. Um, we stand with you um, in understanding the magnitude of this problem. And um, we know that Philadelphia is known for its diversity. Source of income discrimination harms the city's goal of fair housing practices across all neighborhoods. These types of discriminatory practices disproportionately impact minority families, which lead to displacement and lower quality of life. Our mission is to end this, this discriminatory practice as well as all forms of discrimination. And we stand committed to partnering with uh, city council to uh, enhance the protections for Philadelphia's vulnerable populations. Um, with that said, uh, thank you for your time and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Gee, for um, your testimony, but also for the work that you do on a daily basis to um, protect people's housing and to enforce on bad actors. And, you know, we on City Council want to make sure that um, the Fair Housing Commission has the support and the resources necessary um, to, to protect people even more. Um, and thank you. Um, my first set of questions uh, for this panel are for uh, Kelvin Jeremiah. Are you still there? I'm here. Okay. Um, can you uh, describe how proactive and, ha and hands-on uh, PHA staff are with voucher households during their apartment searches? We heard from several people that they felt that they needed, that they kind of were out there on their own and they felt that they needed um, more assistance in terms of finding um, a suitable place to use their, their voucher. Um, so can you just talk about what, how that typically goes and can you also describe um if there are things that you want to to add to that um in order to help folks to to use their vouchers more effectively so uh, absolutely madam chair what underlies the housing choice voucher program is choice and so we have to be as pha uh, the administrator of the housing choice voucher program we have to be particularly careful not to steer um residents or participants into any particular geographic location that would be uh illegal having said that um we painstakingly work with our participants as well as landlords so there are a number of resources that we provide remember that it's voluntary um that we provide to recipients um for example we have uh, vacancy lists that uh, we receive from various landlords who we know are participating in the program. We have Go Section 8 um, uh, as, a, as another uh, electronic resource. We frequently reach out to landlords in uh, high opportunity areas to help navigate, uh, help a tenant navigate rental in those in those areas. And so it, it, it is very hands on every re, every participant um, is assigned to a case manager and that case manager is not only responsible for helping the, the participant um, with the issuance of the of the voucher, but to help them find uh, find units to the extent that the units are available. What we're finding, though, is all too often Units are more readily available in certain geographic locations uh, of the city. Often those locations are, are not the most desirable, in part because the rents there are, are the lowest, uh, tends to be uh, at the lowest levels. And so there is a lot of effort that is put in the upfront. So when a tenant uh, comes to PHA and issue a voucher, um, the voucher uh, outlines the dates that the voucher is um, will be good for uh, up to 120 days. The extensions are permitted and we do that very liberally. Um, it, it does not contain um, the the voucher uh, quote unquote amount because as you well know that changes virtually by zip code and location uh, by neighborhoods uh, etc. It looks something like this. 
But in addition, so that's the voucher. It's about a four-page document that, that they get signed by PHA in the name of the voucher. What is there is the unit size. Um, so it could be anywhere from zero to a one bedroom to six bedrooms, uh, as, as an example. Every voucher uh, recipient, it's important to note, receives this, um, which is a PHA guide um, a housing search and moving guide, uh, most recently updated November 2022, and it outlines all of the steps that are required. Everything you need to know from the minute that you have um, the issue, the voucher, the introduction, how to search for a unit when your voucher expires, um, how your the rents are determined, what is required for for inspection. Um, and so all of those things, yes, um, it's it's very technical, it's very involved uh, because the law requires us as the administrator of the program to adhere to certain certain requirements. Council member, I, I will not exaggerate, but these are these are the regulations. There are four volumes. Right, that we have to adhere to, and so yes, is it is it bureaucratic? Absolutely. Um, it's not the same when a private tenant or market rate tenant goes out and look for a unit. The landlord isn't subject to any HQS inspections. We are required to do an HQS inspection. The landlord isn't um, PHA. Um, as the administrator is required to engage with the landlord to make sure that the rents are quote unquote reasonable, which requires a rent reasonableness uh, test. We have to make sure that the, the family, uh, the household can afford to pay that rent, their portion um, uh, of the rent, not exceeding uh, in the case of PH actually 28%, but not exceeding uh, the 30% uh, threshold. And so the incentive programs that we have um, is aimed at addressing some of those barriers. Uh, the sign-in bonus, for example, is to bridge the gap. So if it takes 30 days, um, and a, 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 a landlord would be able to be compensated for the time that it takes us to go through the inspection process. And yes, we often do find um, as part of the process that, you know, there isn't a smoke detector or a window is broken or there are egress issue. Um, you know, you just you just name it. If the unit fails inspection, it requires reinspection. And so a lot of that that is involved before we can actually sign somebody up and approve the lease, we have to ensure that the unit meets habitability the hard required habitability test, which is the HQS standard. Thank you. Um, based on the testimony that you heard today, um, I would ask you and Ms. Hirsch, um, are there, you know, based on particularly what the tenant said about how hard it was to use vouchers, um, are there things that you would add to um, the support that is offer to tenants um, to find units if if resources were available. I know that all of this demands on resources, but I'm interested in hearing what you think could change. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think there are a number of solutions. It's it's quite you know disheartening uh, to hear some of the stories um, from the, the the participants who are at Bartram Village and looking to, to get Section 8 housing, a housing choice voucher. Um, the, the stories that we heard from the gentleman um, who has uh, some disabilities. Um, it, it's really disheartening uh, because I know from uh, PHA's perspective, we've spent a lot of time um, helping uh, best, we, best we can. Um, in terms of the the need for for resources, I will echo some of the con some of the su suggestions that we've already uh, heard. Um, I think we have to be bold uh, and intentional in how we use the resources that that we have. Um, as I said, we've already spent the over a million dollars, and we're continuing in terms of the landlord incentive programs. I would love to expand that opportunity. But these are monies that PHA is taking out of its operating funds that could go directly to providing housing 
towards combating housing issues, right? Um, you know, I would love to 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 work more closely with uh, the the commission um, to to broaden its its reach so that we're right. speaking in in tandem. You know, in my in my early public service life, I was a housing uh, com discrimination compliance officer, uh, and I investigated a lot of complaints in 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 that area. Uh, I would love to see the council. Um, providing uh, more resources to the commission, so that they can, or a uh, or advocacy group to do the kind of testing. One of the ways that we combat um, housing discrimination is actually to do the testing. You're not going to hear landlords often when they decline somebody. They're not telling us it's because you're black or you're woman mm -hmm. or you're single, etc. Um, they will tell you that it's because of your criminal record. It's because of um, uh, is it, is because of your your credit, etc. Um, one of the the biggest areas to to help navigate and provide that kind of information that allows us to to combat housing discrimination is to do that testing and to bring those cases um, uh, against those landlords uh, and have you know more tougher penalties for those violation. Um, I typically didn't didn't settle those cases. Unless they were getting, they were incredibly punitive on the on, on the landlords, and I did a lot of that, and I think we can. Um, I, I would I would also say that you know part of why this was so disheart disheartening is because of our own landlord outreach and tenant outreach program. So every tenant goes to goes through um, a a voucher briefing, uh, and this is part of the voucher briefing. Every landlord that participates in the program goes through that. I am far more concerned about those landlords that do not. Um, you know, and I would I would respectfully suggest to the council that perhaps as part of the issuance of the rental license that maybe that be a condition, mm -hmm. a fair housing uh, training uh, would be a condition of the issuance of that um, uh, of, of that license. Uh, I don't want to make it more bureaucratic. But I think we want to make sure that people are in the know. And too often, as Lee suggested uh, a moment ago, um, they tend to say, no, we don't. We never heard about the Housing Choice Voucher Program or we never heard about Section 8. Uh, but what was telling from the analysis that the city did is that 67% didn't care to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I would also ask, is there anything stopping the city from requiring, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of things that would want to stop the city from this, but is there anything stopping the city from requiring enrollment in these programs if you were to receive a rental license? Do uh, any of you know I, that? I, 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 I am not specifically aware. I would only, uh, I would only part point to the, the Pittsburgh case um, that might be where, where the, the, the Supreme Court said, uh, that it's a voluntary program. So you know, I, I think that might be legislation that might need to come from uh, the state and not the city. Ms. Uh, Bernstein, I know you wanted to also offer some comment on the Pittsburgh case. Can you do that here? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. I just, um, with regards to the to the Pittsburgh case that came out of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, um, that the Pittsburgh ordinance was similar to Philadelphia's, but Pittsburgh's home rule charter has limitations um, as a second class city, including a business exclusion. And that's what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down their ordinance on. Um, there, that statute is 53 PA CSA 2962. But Philadelphia's home rule charter, excuse me, home rule is a first class city. And does not have that limitation. That's 53 PA CSA 13101. So I just wanted to quickly raise that distinction because it's a really, really important one in the conversation about Philadelphia's source of income protection. Thank you so much. And can you Thank also you. comment on the possibility of requiring enrollment in these programs at, um, if you are to receive a rental license in Philadelphia? Is that um, possible or is that uh, would that be prohibited? And I think it's an interesting idea. It's not one that I have, um, you know, completely thought through, but I think it's one that we should talk about. I'd be happy to, you know, work with the members of the committee um, and anyone else, of course, to to talk about that and what that might look like to make sure that it's um, it makes sense under the law, the state laws, and the city laws, and the federal laws. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, going back to Ms. Hirsch, um, thank you for your testimony earlier. You talked about um, how OHS is trying to create um, you know, a better way for landlords to and property owners to really connect to information about Section 8 and other programs. Um, it, are you doing anything sort of, what do you think needs to happen on the tenant side? We heard a lot of testimony around from people who said it was really hard for them to use vouchers and they kind of felt like they didn't have um, enough support. Um, is OHS thinking through um, this aspect of the voucher program and um, what ideas do you have based on the testimony that you heard? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it's, I um, I share Kelvin's um, uh, expression of how disheartening um, it's it's heartbreaking really um, and I think uh, with our and also um, with the young adults the the issues that they're um, encountering are definitely more severe than adults because they have the I mean you know the bias that people have against young people partying and all of that sort of thing that they have to overcome um, and I think um, through the process we're going through with the, with the uh, youth homelessness demonstration project planning, I, um, what they have expressed to us is that they would really like somebody to walk beside them to explain mm -hmm. how do you find a unit, help me negotiate with the landlord, help me understand mm -hmm. the application and what's legal and what's not. So um, I think that, uh, um, you know, and some people, they, you know, they have the wherewithal to do all this on their own and they figure it out, I think. But I think for others, more education, um, more walking side by side with them, more information. I think all of those things would be hugely helpful. I think for us, um, we we have uh, the limitations that we have are resource limitations. Uh, we have one case manager to about every 20 residents, uh, and they're working with people at all different stages in their housing search. Um, and so there are just limits, which is why we focused on giving them resources uh, like PAD Mission, like the housing navigators, uh, because it's uh, been a way of helping more of our participants by helping, by giving the, um, the, the housing case managers more resources. Um, I will say that uh, some of the upstream th um, strategies that really that we saw really made a difference were the landlord incentives. Um, you know, rental properties are a business and money talks. And so the incentives that PHA put on the ground uh, for um, with the emergency housing vouchers, uh, we saw those be very successful. We've actually expanded our incentives related to our rapid rehousing program. Uh, so we now give um, more upfront money um, and the, that loss contingency fund. Uh, those things, I think, also really, really make a difference. Um, uh, so those are some of the things that I think we would put on our wish list it, um, uh, that what we think would be helpful. And certainly if there's other ideas that people have, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. I'm going to I have two more questions for Kia and then I'm going to open up to committee because we are going rather long. But this even though this is something we could probably talk about all day. Um, Ms. Gee, um, what resources does you know the Fair Housing Commission need to expedite its investigations and determinations after a complaint is filed? And, and I mean in terms of staffing in terms of you know resources from the budget what what do you all need to be able to do more of what you do so i would um i would tend to agree with some of the testimony that's already been said in terms of resources needed for testing for proactive enforcement which is um, one of the biggest problems is that right now we have with our existing infrastructure we have um more more of a reactive um, enforcement uh, okay. scope. And so we rely on the complaints that come in, but frankly, the number of complaints that we receive are not matching the magnitude of, of the, the, the crisis that's being described here today. 
Um, so having testers to be able to go out into the field and see um, what's going on firsthand and, and so we can initiate those complaints on our own. Um, also, in terms of investigations, we have over the last 18 months since I've been here been focusing on efficiency and comprehensiveness in terms of investigate investigation, clearing our um, our caseloads of old cases that um, we have sufficient information to make be able to make a determination. So I would say in terms of increasing the speed of the investigation, um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident right now that when cases come through, they're given adequate attention and we're handling them as quickly as possible um, to get to a resolution that's uh, equitable for the complainant. Um, we need more resources. We need okay. funding for investigators. We have a very, very, very small team. Um, uh, our agency is both their housing um, commission as well as the Commission on Human Relations. Can you sort of just expound when you say a small team, how many um, people do the work of the Fair Housing Commission? We have six investigators for all kinds of discrimination. So we, there's over 17 protected classes, source of income being one of them. Um, so, uh, and, and as I said, the three major categories, public accommodation, housing, and employment. And so our investigators are looking at all of that. Um, and so we just, if we had more resources, we could do more targeted um, mm -hmm. outreach. Wow. Do you have a sense of how many staff is more appropriate to both have a proactive um, as well as a really strong sort of investigative um, and enforcement arm? I think if we were to be able to have enough staff to have a task force that looks specifically at source of income, um, that would at least be, you know, um, more than we have now. I'm going to say at least three. Three. I'm, I don't want to be greedy. I come from, you know, a humble beginnings, and I'm just honored to actually be here testifying. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would be testifying for city council. So, um, I, I would say that we'll, we're happy. We'll make it work with what we have, but if we have more, we can do more. And I know that with the problem being what it is. We need to do more, but we'll be happy if we could get three more investigators. We'll be happy if we could get two more investigators. If we can get double, we'd be ecstatic and we'd be able to do a lot of great work in terms of this um, protection. We can be greedy when it comes to housing justice. And um, if you're, you know, I know you have uh, limitations, but me and Kendra will be greedy for you as well as the rest of <laughs> the rest of the housing committee. <laughs> Um, I'll actually end my questions right there because I know we are uh, taking a really long time. Are there other members of the committee that have questions or comments for the panel? I just have a clarifying question. I know you talked about this is for Kia. Um, um, you, uh, the question, income discrimination. Is it currently legal for landlords to make, publish, or circulate or issue any display of written communication uh, with the language that says no Section 8? It's not expli explicitly or expressly written in the Fair Practices Ordinance in that way. I think it would be helpful for landlords to see that so that they know it's expressly prohibited. But right now, it, the act itself is unlawful because you're doing they are doing it to dissuade um, renters from renting. So that's disparate treatment for them. Um, but I do think when it's clear in, in uh, written language, that's easier for a provider to understand. So is it an idea of like legislation to like add like a private right of action associated with that? If there were, yes, if they add a private right of action, um, I think that uh, landlords will be more likely to, um, less likely rather, to, to make advertisements containing that language because they know they will be immediately held accountable by people who are um, disadvantaged based on that that um, language. So if if that's the case, could that be done for all like housing discrimination um, prohibitations? So there is so there is a private right of action that exists once we've completed our investigation. Um, but they have to go through our process. 
Um, but if there was something in the legislation that clearly identifies that that alone, using this particular type of language, would be um, sufficient to uh, trigger a, a, the, a filing of a complaint against them in a court of you know competent jurisdiction, I think that would stop a lot of it. Okay. All right. Um. Thank you so much. I th one other question I have. I think with Brent, or maybe Kelvin, this might be for you. Like, what is the process for granting the extensions on the vouchers? So if people are unable to find an apartment, what is the process for the extension um, if they aren't able to find it within the 30 day time with, frame? Within 120 days, it's simply uh, contacting um, the caseworker and requesting an extension. So, I mean, we've had phone calls from there's, people that have been unable that, to contact. They're having a hard time contacting their case caseworker yeah, to they, make that happen. So, so they they can come into our into into our office. There is a form that they can complete, and they can submit that. They can um, download the form uh, online uh, uh, as well and have it completed. Uh, we would accept it uh, over over email uh, as well. Okay. Uh, okay. That, that's it. That's all my questions, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Bass. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I just, I just had a quick question for uh, Liz, actually. Um, Liz, can you go back over those numbers that you gave us earlier? 80% plus of landlords did not, were not aware of um, uh, yes. uh, the, the vouchers in their requirement yes. to accept the vouchers. Um, and then there was 60, uh-huh. Yep. Um, so 77% said they did not currently rent to Housing Choice Vouchers holders. 82% said they didn't know about the emergency right. housing voucher program. Uh, that was when it was brand new. We had just gotten it from the federal government. And 62% said they were not interested in learning about the emergency housing voucher program. And I, I asked that because it really, you know, that uh, those numbers really struck me uh, hard because, you know, it just seems as if the, there's a, such a stigma around people who have the vouchers um, that they can't even get their foot in the door because people are even unwilling to, uh, at any point, give any consideration if you have a voucher. And so my question is, I know that there was a question in terms of uh, making it a requirement to uh, th that land back to accept, um, and, and that question uh, wasn't able to be answered today. But my question is, beyond requirement, is there? do we do anything to incentivize, or can we think of something to do to incentivize uh, landlords to at least be aware, and um, hopefully that would open up uh, some opportunities. And, and Kelvin, my good friend Kelvin, I don't know if you want to uh, weigh in on that as well. Sure. Um, so I think this is, a, is an excellent, excellent question. I think we we sought to address the barriers to accessing um, market rate units uh, through our incentive programs and. Uh, when we did that, we saw, as I as I shared in my in my testimony, a a market increase, a marked increase in participation among private landlords, um, especially landlords in the higher opportunity uh, neighborhoods. I think now we are hovering over uh, 1,800 participants in in those in those neighborhoods, um, mm -hmm. and so we have to remember, uh, in my view, that this is. A, a business, and the stereotypes that exist, um, the negative feedback that we've gotten, we've done this, we've brought in mm -hmm. property owners and we talked to them. What do we need from you? What do you need from us to, to encourage, to nudge participation? Part of the issue was the bureaucratic nature of the process. Yeah. They can go out and they yes. can rent to somebody without having an inspection. We require mm -hmm. an inspection. Um, and so we try to streamline that that process uh, considerably so that they're not losing money 
every time a unit goes on field in the private market, it means that the landlord is on con collecting rent. They want to collect rent. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the signing bonuses um, is intended to, to bridge some of that, that gap. Secondly, um, one of the one of the biggest issue that we heard from landlords is, you know, when we rent to a person, uh, a private uh, market rate uh, tenant, um, the damage to those units are nearly uh, comparable to to the HCV participants, and so you know they have to. Know, and we let me back up as, and say, PHA is the landlord as well. Right, so we see it in in yes. in some practical mm -hmm. in some practical ways, and so a landlord uh, who have to rent to some who's renting to an HCV participant, incurring incredible costs to uh, make their units ready after um, after a tenant moves out um, is a is discouraging, um, and so the landlord incentive uh, assurance. Uh, of $2,500 net of um, the security deposit is aimed at doing just that. So those are the two barriers uh, for us, and I would love to see um, the you know the city help support those those initiatives. Um, we certainly don't have uh, endless resources to to be able to do this. We're doing it as I mentioned because of the state of the housing crisis in 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 Philadelphia. Um, and so we've ex we, we've we've extended it to uh, June uh, 30th of this year because of the response uh, that we've been we've been we've been getting. Uh, but it's something that I think is is very worthwhile, and we've been in con concert. Yeah. We've been talking to HUD about providing specific funding um, to help support those initiatives in communities where uh, there is affordability issues. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, they would consider that. You know, some, something you just said, uh, Kelvin, just, just gave me some pause regarding the requirement for the inspection. And so if you have two units, let's say on one particular street and um, one unit um, requires an inspection, um, because it, you know it's, it's going through the program and then there's another unit where um, the landlord uh, doesn't want to accept the voucher because they don't want an inspection, then that says to me that the quality of the housing that's being provided by that particular landlord is suspect. And mm -hmm. so I don't know, has there been any um, any thought about some sort of a partnership with l and I maybe to do um, inspections? Uh, more inspections of all properties, I guess, uh, but particularly of those that are, um, you know, uh, I, I, I would say where a landlord is specifically declining because of the the um, reason that they don't want to do an inspection. Is that a possibility? Uh, have you have you thought about that or? No, I I, I honestly uh, haven't, uh, Councilmember Bass. Uh, I think all of our uh, participants, landlord participating in the uh, HCV program, they're all of those units, more than 19, 20,000 uh, are mm -hmm. subject to the inspection. And so we inspect sure. them. Um, yes. uh, we would not have a, a basis. Uh, I don't know if mm -hmm. LNI does. I think that perhaps that would be a great, great question for law and, and LNI to explore whether or not it's an issue. Yeah. Of, Habitat, uh, whether or not the units are habitable. Sure. Uh, being yeah. yeah. Because I'm assuming that, um, you, you know, you don't want an inspection for a reason. Right. <laughs> There's right. a reason that you don't want anybody coming in and poking around and taking a look around. So, okay. All right. Thank you. And and and, and thank you all for the work that you do. And um, Kia, thank you for being here and testifying today and for your hard work um, around this very, very important issue. So I appreciate all of you and want to say thank you for the work you're doing and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Council Member Bass. Um, thank you, Council Member. Thank you um, for that uh, really important and interesting discussion. Um, I agree with everybody here that we have to make this program more financially viable for landlords, easier. We have to do education. But I do also want to challenge this uh, sort of 
comment that I've heard several times that being a landlord is a business. I completely agree with that. But in no other business is it acceptable to have blatant discrimination, so much so that you're going to put it on your, your website or put it on you know your application. If I were to walk into an establishment and they told me I cannot come into that establishment because I'm Black or because I'm a single mom or because I'm poor or whatever, um, I just think the follow the uh, sort of follow through on that would be different. And we have to take that same approach um, as it relates to people's housing. Um, and so anyway, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I just want we, to. We don't, we don't disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> we don't disagree with you at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Um, are there other uh, questions or comments for this panel from members of the committee? Thank you. Um, that concludes panel testimony for this uh, resolution. Um, Ms. Schurls, do we have anyone registered to provide public comment today? No, Chair. Okay. Um, we will now take a brief break to, um, oops, no, no, sorry. There being no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I will ask if there is anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have failed to call and that wishes to offer testimony on the resolution being considered today. Hearing none, um, this concludes the business um, before the Committee on Housing, Neighborhood Development um, in the Homeless. I wanna thank everybody for coming and being a part of this critical um, discussion. Um, I want everyone watching and everybody in, in the hearing today to know that we're not just gonna drop this issue. This is not just about a hearing. Um, this was to uncover solutions um, to move forward so that we can help um, people get housing. Um, um, and so thank you to everyone who has participated today. Thank you so much to all the members of the committee and thanks to everyone watching. Um, I hope you all have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.